Um, so I'm going to start. I guess I go ahead. I got the thumbs up. Uh, my name is Daryl Higa. I'm one of the designers at uh, War Game in Chicago, Baltimore. Uh, and uh, in my previous life, yes, I was a college professor. Uh, you might have heard that in some of the streams. Uh, my, uh, my, actually, my expertise was in international relations, which doesn't sound like it's related, but I'll get into that because you'll find that it actually, in a weird way, is all related to this. So uh, it's really weird because they let me pick the topic, so I'm sorry. You guys are going to go to history lesson because that's the kind of stuff I'm into. And this is going to be a discussion about ground strategy and its relationship to armored warfare. A lot of times when people talk about tanks and they talk about things and they talk about you know world of tanks and everything else, they really fixate on like specific tanks, how to use a tank on the battlefield and everything else. The interesting thing is putting that in historical context kind of gives you a different picture because a lot of times you're like, why the hell did they build a tank this way, right? Like it makes no sense. Until you realize the strategic context in which it was built and then suddenly it makes sense again. So I'm going to talk more about grand strategy and doctrine, because those two things are stuff I, I, I love to talk about. I wish this were better organized. I will admit that this is not a neat sort of thesis where I move from point A to point B. I tried my best to do it, but I realized it was a really big topic, and there's a lot of scattered associations. And because it's talking about history, it's one damn thing after another. So because of that, sometimes it doesn't flow as logically as I would like, but I think you'll get the idea. So again, sort of the alternative thing is how things affect tanks work that have nothing to do with how tanks work. Because honestly, when you're sometimes you're playing with a tank, you're like, why would they send? Uh, why would they send? Is it on? Yeah. Okay. I can yeah. find it before. So Perfect. why would you send your soldiers out in this tank? Because it's got A, or B, or C problems, right? Well, usually there is a real reason. So first of all, you know, everyone always talks about their credentials and everything else. And I want to get, make it absolutely clear, I never served in the military. I am not, you know, I'm not, you know, there are people in our audience, in our staff also who have served, so I'm not one of them. So I don't pretend to have any extra expertise or anything like that. I am definitely, well, I do like to cook, and I'm definitely a chair-born warrior. So just keep that in mind, okay? That aside, I do have some backgrounds. Uh, background in all of this. Uh, my, I thought I'd list some of my favorite games because obviously Wargaming is a company that talks a lot about games. So um, from board games, you know, everyone starts off with sort of the, the World War II risk, which is Axis and Allies, Squad Leader, you know, Assault, Harpoon, all of these games. I've listed a bunch of games that I really like. As you can see, some of them are grognar crunchy and some of them are very, very basic. I do like to run the gamut. I actually think that games that cover strategy and grand strategy actually look more like risk. That's because they're not meant to be crunchy, because you're making big decisions. And um, and sometimes, you know, and there's a whole hierarchy of, of this kind of stuff, and we'll talk about it, because I have here represented a, very, a hierarchy of strategic thinking, all the way from grand strategy down to tactical and field ground. So we'll get onto all of that. And of course, from computer games, there's a long legacy of this. I've worked on some of those products, to give you an idea, uh, in, including Ebony, but uh, I do play a lot of war games, and they're not just the Twitch shooter types. Definitely, I'm into strategy games, as you can see. So, for academia, my my uh, I have a PhD in international relations, and international relations is called different things in different schools. It's also sometimes called diplomatic history. It's sometimes called international political economy. So actually it draws upon a bunch of different disciplines and usually you have a specialization in there. My specialization was international security studies where the guys who drew circles on maps to figure out how many people would die in a nuclear strike, how to, how to fight a, a nuclear war, how to prevent a nuclear war. And um, one of the things that I was always interested in is the concept of conventional deterrence. Can you have conventional deterrence the same way you have nuclear deterrence? So these are the kind of, kind of things that I used to deal with in academia. So yes, actually, I do have some background and it is somewhat related to all of this. And finally, in terms of my work, I worked in a number of studios. The interesting thing that would be uh, for people here is that I worked at Real Time Studios and Institute for Creative Technology, which is in Southern California, and they did a number of um, simulators for the US military. And what this was is the Institute of Creative Technologies was a branch of the University of Southern California that was dedicated to combining academics from Southern California with members of the Hollywood, you know, with Hollywood, Hollywood movie and games folks 
and give them an opportunity to work with the military. Because I tell you, it's a very, making games is a very different experience than making a piece of software for the military. And there has to be an interface there. So um, I was working at a different uh, game company at the time, and they said, you know, we're looking for someone who's got academic background, who is a game developer, who can speak military. And I was like, you know, I'm definitely gonna apply for this because I'm not quite sure how many people around in the industry at the time really had those qualifications. And I did, and I worked on a number of projects for the military, including the second image down, that's a program called Elect Bilat, which is basically what I would call an Iraqi RPG. Because <laughs> basically what it was is the idea that you were solving a number of civil military problems in Iraq. This was meant for the lieutenant colonel level and above. And it became so popular with the uh, military, they said, oh my god, we have to get everyone through this. But of course, it was a, you know, it was basically built in Unreal Tournament, and it was an RPG where you had to make decisions and all this other stuff. And it was a very complex decision tree. Like, there was no, I think everyone's used to the idea that there's a right and wrong answer. This was one, depends on who you talk to, whose story you got, kind of, did, you know, kind of influenced your decision. Then you realize halfway down the decision tree, oh, this guy, you know, was, Kind of, he wasn't necessarily misrepresenting himself, but I only heard half the story, and I've now made a bad mistake. So it was just kind of training this and cultural sensitivity. It was really strange because we set this up in Unreal Tournament, and uh, you know we had a pretty limited budget because it was for the military and everything else. So some of the props were really like kind of generic props, and they put them all on the desk. And then later on, the U.S. Army came out with a video because they couldn't run people through the software fast enough, so they made movies, and they made movies, and they duplicated all the items that were like in there, and I was like. You didn't have to duplicate that stuff. We really, we just grabbed what we could. But anyway, it was really funny. So I worked on that. Then the other thing I worked at, if you've ever been to Port Sill and you've been for Call for Fires, if you're an artillery person, we made the call, uh, what's called JFETs. And it's sometimes called the holodeck over there because basically what we did is that we either had rooms that you had to actually breach and secure that out, overlooked into a city, and those were all projectors. We blew in 100 degree air through the windows and stuff like that to make it extra realistic. And then we also had these uh, 300 degree projection screens overhead as well. And what those were were called for fire trainers. And the idea here was that, and we're using VR and motion tracking and all this other stuff. So basically you pick up the binoculars and you'd see what you would see if you're looking through binoculars. And we we're using it so that the instructor knew exactly what you were looking at with those binoculars. And you had a laser range finder and everything else. Because here's an interesting problem that as a game developer, I never thought about. You have a forward observer, and he's calling down an airstrike on a building. And he goes, and he's telling the pilot that's flying above, hey, I need you to hit that building near the blue water tower. Surprise, surprise, in Iraq, some of those water towers are painted differently on the side that they are on the top. So all of a sudden, you're calling a strike on the wrong place because it looks different from the ground and in the air. So you need to teach your guys that they need to think about what the pilot sees and not just what they see. And so we build a bunch of simulators like that. Lots of fun. I also work on the So I, I do have some kind of, that, that's part of the reason why I came from working on YouTube is that I had a combination of free to play experience, a lot of military experience, and damn it, I really wanted to work, work on mobile things. So that helped. So um, I, I've had multiple roles since I've been in Chicago, Baltimore. Uh, I've also been a live producer. I was on the production team. But then eventually I had a chance to move over to the design team. And in the design team, sort of that's where I get this title of narrative designer, because I, uh, I was working on stuff like war stories and mercenaries, you know, alternative history and stuff like that. If you know my personal interests, you'll, you'll see that that's probably where some of this influence is, whether you where you like it or not, that's kind of where it comes from. Because this whole idea of playing a war game, what if the battle went this way instead of that way, that kind of, see how this is a pattern here? That, that's where this all comes from. And that's where we got war stories and then the, uh, the background world for mercenaries. So that's kind of where we're at now. So that's who I am. Okay, so let's talk about external influences on design, right? And uh, why the heck would they make it this way? So I have three things. You know, Wargaming overall is a big company. I want you to know that there are actually historians in each region that go around measuring armor thickness and stuff like that. You know, a lot of you have seen like Chieftain videos and things like that. We do have a large staff. It's not just the guys in front of the camera. We do have a lot of historians on, on all of the teams. And you look at some of these tanks and you're, 
or some of these vehicles, and you're like, why the heck did they make it this way? The first one over there on the far right, I threw in warships, of course, uh, is that's Akagi, the original version of the Akagi, and you notice that it's a triple deck craft, and of course, it's uh, sort of a very um, distinct side billowing of the, 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 uh, the uh, smokestacks. And then you look in the center, which is the French uh, you want biz tank with a giant radiator on the side, which if you shoot is extremely vulnerable, question mark. And then of course, on the right side here, we see uh, the first iteration of the Panzer for the Germans, which are basically motorcycles, and in a few cases, cars, with the word tank printed on the side, okay? Why would they make these things, right? Well, there's historical and doctrinal reasons why things like this are made, okay? So there, there is a reason, and there is sort of a reason behind all of this. And some of it is really just learning. So a lot of, and I guess this is, at this point, I'll give a little bit of a caveat. At this point, what I'm talking about now uh, largely represents early to mid-war. Because, and you know, for capital ships, probably throughout the war, because you lay down a hull, it's a, it's a four year building time, right? So like most wars are over before any hull you lay during, during a war is sort of set to sea. But with tanks and other stuff, we saw a rapid evolution of tanks in a very, very short period of time. However, the tanks at the, you know, so maybe, you know, tiers one through five or six are the ones that are influenced by the external conditions outside the war. Once, it, once you get to the mid-war, either you evolved or you didn't have a tank industry anymore, right? So I'll get into some of that later. But then, so then that's when you start seeing a convergence between the way the tanks look. And then you look at the post-war period and you see even greater convergence, right? But for now, um, this is sort of when tank design and philosophy was in its infancy. Okay, so next thing, there's a hierarchy here. And every time we say there's a hierarchy, there's assuming that there's rank. There's only rank in the sense that this is a level of organization Decisions made at every level are absolutely critical. So don't get me wrong when I start talking about hierarchy. I'm not implying one thing is more important than the other. I'm just saying that this is a hierarchy in terms of organization and how things are thought. So, uh, and I'm gonna start kind of from the middle, which is weird, but and it's just because I put this in the hierarchical. Usually when we start talking about tanks and we start talking about a given map, or we start talking about like, how am I gonna play in this upcoming, you know, World of Tanks battle or something like that. You're focusing on tactics, which is really cool. That's the neat thing, right? How am I gonna successfully conduct this battle? Where am I gonna put my tank? Or even down to field craft. How am I gonna angle my tank? Where is my gun? What am I gonna shoot at? You know, what is my target selection priority? And what part of the tanks am I gonna shoot, right? This is all very, very important, and those decisions are faithful for that specific battle. However, there are levels above that change it, and the levels before the battle happen, they're thinking that before the battle happened, that all influence why you're fighting, where you're fighting, and what you're fighting with, okay? So grand strategy is obviously, this is basically national objectives and national survival, okay? So grand strategy is what is the big picture? What are we trying to accomplish? How are we trying to accomplish it? Operations are the way that we accomplish these goals. How do we carry them out, right? So different countries label this differently. It's interesting that a lot of times, it doesn't matter which country they are, they talk about the art of operation, or they consider, like when you talk about the art of war, they're really talking about, this is the part that's artful, because this is the part that requires creativity. This is the part that requires ingenuity. And that's kind of the interesting factor in operations. It's tactics we talked about. And doctrine, which is really, really interesting too, is that because war is extremely complex, because of the fact that as modern militaries became more and more complex and more deadly, soldiers were expected to do more and more and more over a shorter period of time, and not necessarily with a lot of battle experience. I mean, movies and Hollywood likes to focus on like you know those units that kept getting put in battle over and over again, but often a lot of times you have to jump into a major you know conflict, and you actually never actually face the enemy before, other than in maneuvers or something like that. So doctrine is something, and I have some experience with this, this is why we build simulators in the US military. This is what the US military is very, very good at, by the way, is trying to figure out some of these problems in advance. And a lot of army bases will tell you we're schoolhouses. They don't even call themselves bases or forts or whatever, they call themselves schoolhouses. And there's a reason. That's because we have to prepare people to fight in conditions that they're not prepared for, that they have not experienced before. <laughs> 
that's where doctrine comes in. So what doctrine you carry into this fight will determine how you're equipped and how you think you should fight, which can have positive and negative consequences. All right, so um, I always start with this sort of classics of military thinking, like what, what are good things to do? Again, I said this is gonna be a little random, but this is where it is. Uh, the two that I think are sort of fundamental to all of this is Art of War, which is written by Sun Tzu. Yeah, you know, amazingly, 544, I mean, he lived from 544 to 496 BC, right? So you think about when that was written. It's amazing because if you read that, you go, oh, this is a modern field manual in the sense that it still has the same relevance, and I think it's really interesting, and actually, there's something unrelated that I can't talk about. I was doing some research on like um, the fact that in the 1960s, the US Army commissioned a study, and the one thing that they found is that because infantry are still the primary mode of fighting, that the, tech, the theoretical ground pace of operations has not changed in 2,000 years. So even though we've added air mobile ability, even though we've added armored warfare, even though we've added all these other features, once the battlefield, the battle space has been defined, it's still at the pace of somebody walking or running, right? So it's kind of an interesting thought. So a lot of people say, well, why should I read a document that's so old? It's still relevant. It's physics. It, you know, it, it, it's talking about all these things. The next one is uh, Carl von Clausewitz on war. And this was written sort of uh, during the Napoleonic period. Um, it's interesting because I, the first copy that I was given was actually from somebody who was, uh, my friend's uh, father was in the Naval War College and he said, oh, you really need to read this. So I read it and it was extremely influential. The funny thing is, I think that this document is so influential in the US military, we still talk about it today. Like for instance, um, when, uh, I'll use Gulf War One as an example because that was much more where we had this kind of mass armor formation moving around and stuff like that. Uh, the, what he quote, you know, the thing that he kept quoting was, "Oh, this is we're trying to get force times, you know, it's like, um, you know, um, force is mass times acceleration, and we're trying to shift, you know, and this physics analogy, and that's actually on war sort of started that whole physics analogy. It was written at a time when Newtonian physics was just coming into preeminence." So they wanted to apply that to military thinking. We still think that way, although we're now in a quantum world, so I don't know what that means in terms of <laughs> physics, but in terms of the analogies, in terms of how uh, war is conducted and why war is conducted, on war is still very relevant in the book. Some additional books that have nothing to do with the talk, but tangential to this, since I had a book reading page, I thought I'd throw them out there. Um, Daniel P. Boger, uh, Dragons at War, which is a very interesting one. That talks about the uh, United States NTC, which is the National Training Center in Fort Irwin. The interesting thing about Fort Irwin is before we ever fought in a war, our guys had all fought in a war because they had actually, that's one of those places where you go um, and uh, the logistics and everything else, you have to bring your own logistics. You have to handle everything. If your guys did not get fed, they did not get fed. This is not a computer simulation. You went out there and you fought an op for it. And the thing that they did is they made up for not a bunch of goofy, uh, not a goofy enemy that's sort of a caricature of your enemy. They knew the terrain better than they did. Their weapons were all at max spec, max theoretical spec, and they were extremely well trained. And they had tons and tons of ex battle experience because they kept doing it over and over again. So it was a very it's interesting to fight a foe like that. I always say, and this is true of game development, you'll see that we talk about like, oh, we have to learn from our mistakes. If you can, it's much, you learn so much more from your mistakes than your successes. And so that's something to keep in mind. Of course, you don't want to fail too much because then you won't be able to correct yourself later on, but that's sort of the idea here. And then uh, Hook Like Hands on Luck is really just interesting for if you're uh, a World War II tank buff because this is where I always get my line where what's my favorite German tank? And I say the, the Panzer IV, the Mark IV, and they go, why? Because all oh, the German commanders I would say, well, when we had a fight, it was great when the Tigers and the Panthers fought, but my Tiger IV, I mean, but my Panther, my Panther IV has always started, so I knew that they were at like, you know, they were at a 90% ready rate instead of like a 40 or 50% ready rate, which is hard to reflect in a game. Trust me, if people have thought about it, and then that would be shit, I mean, that would be <laughs> <laughs> terrible if your tank did not start in the beginning of the battle. <laughs> okay, so um, anyway, let's talk about strategy and grand strategy. So primarily, when we talk about uh, strategy and grand strategy in World War II, what we're talking about here is state survival, right? And that is the preeminent rationale for any kind of strategic decision. 
Uh, Germany, Japan, and Italy were driven by lost imperialism. So they were all the late they were all the late comers to the industrial uh, to not just the industrial revolution but also to the imperialism game. So France, Britain, all had their big colonies. America had internal, basically had internal colonization and spread and had a lot of resources. Germany, Japan, and Italy came in late. And interestingly enough, Germany was, of course, a, you know, a second period industrialization power. So that meant that a lot of their power was coming from petrochemicals and um, more modern industries than, let's say, the, the UK that built a lot of its industry on textiles and things like that, which were required a lot less capital concentration and a lot less external resources. As a consequence of that, um, their primary, they saw for their national survival as expansion, okay? And at the cost of others, okay? So this is not a question of whether this was right or wrong. This is a question of what they saw as their means of national survival. Italy, of course, was cut out of the, the imperialism game, which is why they started being involved in Africa. Japan also saw themselves as being um, one of the few powers to resist uh, European colonialism, and therefore they would become a colonial power themselves. Okay. Uh, Germany had sort of further, further sort of uh, rationale and strategic thinking in their mind is that they had fought and lost World War I. And what was that lesson is that we're going to have to fight a two-front war. How can we do all, how can we achieve the political objectives that we have in mind? We have to fight efficiently and we have to fight cheaply. Okay? If you don't think this is true, think about the fact that Germany did not go into a wartime economy until like 43, right? They actually tried to preserve the normal mode of economy well into 42, they, until they realized that, oh no, this is, we're in a lot of trouble. We do need to actually rationalize our economic process. So that tells you something there, that they really were concerned about economic disruption. Okay, uh, Japan is an interesting case. Uh, I think that uh, it's interesting. Uh, there's actually a, a recent Japanese movie that came out that kind of uh, Isoroku Yamamoto, they, they remade him. Uh, this was a Japanese movie, not a US movie, and they made him. And they really brought to highlight one of the big strategic debates in the IJN. Uh, you know, obviously between the IJN and the IJA, uh, Japan is an island power. It knew that it had to rely on its navy. What's interesting is even within the IJN, there was a big divide over, over uh, whether they would fight for decisive battle or attrition warfare, right? That's why you have, uh, like if you play warships, and you know, like Japanese destroyers are actually pretty nasty, and they were all trained in night fighting, right? So not only did they have the advantage of long lands uh, torpedoes, which is a temporary technological advantage, but they also fought with the idea that they could not defeat the US Navy outright. But that they could do is they could make the war so costly that you know the Americans would sue for peace, and uh, yeah, well, yeah. And the other thinking was the decisive fleet battle, which is why you have Pearl Harbor, which is why you have Midway, is that if we can engage the Americans in a large decisive fleet battle and do enough damage, they'll sue for peace. Except unless you screw up and you don't deliver a declaration of war in advance. So that's why the Navy was so pissed about that because obviously. They were not planning on fighting a war that would that that you know where Americans were basically pushed to be to fighting uh, you know a, 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 a war where there was no no concept of surrender or okay you've achieved your political objectives we'll stop total war right uh, France um, France learned unfortunately probably the long wrong lessons from World War One which was the idea that a defensive war could be fought and would be effective and that they would have time and they would be able to trade land for territory. It should also be said, because I know a lot of people like making film French and everything else, but also one thing that should be kept in mind was that France politically was extremely divided at this point. You had a, a lot of internal turmoil with the Popular Front and everything else. It was a divided country. There was no consensus in the country on how to do anything politically. None of the governments had complete legitimacy in terms of political control. That had a pronounced effect on their decisions on the battlefield. The United Kingdom stuck with the ocean as our shield, and that served them well. Really, honestly, even though I'm the one who said let's do Operation Sea Lion, I don't actually think that that's quite plausible. Um, there, it would have been very, very difficult. Uh, you know, one could argue that the Battle of Britain might have turned the other way if Hitler did not get so antsy and decide to move from counter. Uh, from counter 
forced to counter value warfare, where he switched targets, he start bombing cities instead of focusing on the RAF and RAF production facilities. Something we can talk a little bit more about later. But you know, th this is an idea where basically the United Kingdom decided that the ocean would be a shield, and that served them very well throughout this. It also meant that they got cut off from their empire, which was also a big problem for them and would have an impact on their strategic decisions. The Soviet Union decided to do what they did when Napoleon attacked and trade land for time. And I don't think that this is necessarily one where they did it so, like, where this was, yes, this is, you know, we're happy to use this strategy. This was a strategy that was, that they just were forced to take. However, they did it brilliantly, right? And when you think about how they had to move all of their industrial power, you know, like all of their industrial power was, was west of the Urals, and they had to move it east of the Urals. And that would have a tremendous effect on this war because, for reasons we'll talk about later on, Germany never developed the long range bomber stuff, so that actually had an effect on all that too. Okay, and the United States, arsenal of democracy in Europe first. So you'll, you'll see, I talk, when I talk about the mercenaries world, the funny thing is that I always say, well, America decided on a Pacific first strategy uh, the, the, the reason why I do that is I, I contend that that's the only reason, real reason why you could have World War II take a lot longer than it did. Is it uh, because Hitler decided to declare war in the United States right after uh, Pearl Harbor and uh, because they felt very strongly about the Japan alliance and because you know FDR was looking for an excuse to engage in Europe, he probably would have done it even if there was no declaration of war, but because he chose the Europe first strategy, that really, because all what that basically did is that that accelerated our ability to aid both the United Kingdom and the Soviet Union, and basically use the United Kingdom as a giant aircraft carrier off the shore of Europe, and that had a big strategic that that had a big um, impact strategic uh, in terms of strategic position. So now let's get to the nitty gritty. So how does this impact tanks, and how does this impact the game that we're playing? So I'm going to focus on the three major, uh, the three major tank producers because that's actually where you see the most impact. I would argue that for France, United Kingdom, Italy, and Japan, they were in a largely reactive mode, and so even technology-wise, we see that a lot of theirs is what we could build with what we have. Okay. However, for Germany, the Soviet Union, and the United States, they took three very different strategies, and if we go back to our grand strategy, you can kind of see why they did this, right? So Germany was focusing on technological superiority and resisting wartime economy. So in other words, we're not gonna worry about mass production. We're not gonna worry about gearing up the economy. We are going to rely on tanks that are so technologically advanced that we do not have to build them in large numbers. Also, we don't have a large number of, uh, you know, we're basically fighting a two-front war. Germany can only produce so many troops, right? So because of that, we are going to focus on technological superiority because of that, we won't have to necessarily strain our economy as well. This is the thinking. Not necessarily successful, but that's the thinking. That kind of thinking produces things like the Tiger P, which I absolutely love, but it's such an anomaly, and you think about it, right? Uh, and I'll talk more about the Tiger P later, because that's my favorite example of this idea of using technological superiority and resisting going to a wartime economy. Okay? Flip side, Soviet Union. We are being invaded. We've had to move all of our industry, you know, basically uplift whole factories and have them working before there's even a roof built over our heads. And we need armor, okay? So we are going to mass produce, and we are going to mass produce in huge numbers. Do we worry about how this thing is designed? Do we worry about the maintenance of this thing? Do we worry about crew comfort? No, worry about that later. And that's exactly what the Soviets did. So, uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, my favorite one is Chieftain trying to get out of uh, trying to get out of a tank or something like that. It's really cramped. You know, they said we are building these tanks. We need these tanks now. I mean, you know, Solomon guy, they're rolling off out of the factory floor right onto the battle. I'm paying them so much, right? So that tells you that they needed tanks immediately. So their focus was primarily on what was the minimum needed. Well, how long is the tank going to last? Build it for them. United States. Well, we knew that. Uh, Hopefully, if the, you know, it didn't look like Japan was really going to be able to mount a credible offensive to the actual mainland, that uh, basically we are going to do what we do best. We make cars and we make a lot of them. So what we're going to do is we're going to make tanks and we're going to make a lot of them. And more importantly, we're going to make trucks and we're going to make a lot of them. A lot of people really focus on, and I know all those trucks 
there would not be much of a game. <laughs> Even I, as somebody who's totally into logistics, acknowledge that. Um, but you know, trucks were really one of the big strategic assets, right? Uh, German commanders said, wow, there's like a Jeep and truck for every GI. It drove them nuts, right? Because they were still using horseback. I mean, a lot of people, it's not in the imagery. I know some modern World War II movies are a little bit better now about showing German forces still using horseback. You know, still using horse-drawn uh, uh, logistics, but that was a major factor for them, and that was a very <coughs> limiting factor. The Americans were like, oh. um, I, I, this is, "Sorry, this is a total side note," but I and I have not verified it because I was a I was a kid at the time. But my um, my one of my dad's friends was in the Corps of Engineers, and his story that he always told us is that Patton was approaching, and they were trying to build a bridge, and they're trying to get the pontoon bridge across, and it was, it was going really, really slowly. Patton shows up in a jeep and goes, why isn't my bridge built yet? And he goes, oh, sorry, sir, it's taking a long time to get the supplies off him. And then, you know, and then unloading the supplies and then building the edge of the bridge and then bringing the truck back. He goes, just drive the truck off. I need that bridge now. And so apparently they're okay. So in other words, they would drive the truck to the edge of the bridge, unload it, drive the truck off, build. The next truck would line up and, just, and, they, and they were able to get the bridge across. Time. That's the story I heard. I don't know if it's really true, but it's actually a really cool story. Sounds like that. And, and it sounds like something that engineers would, you know, love to tell, right? Afterwards. So, anyway, so the idea that the U.S. had that kind of luxury in terms of its material production, that it could think like that. No other country had that. Uh, we were building a Liberty ship every day. We were building an escort carrier every month. We built 50,000 Sherman. On top of that, we built all the trucks for all the Allies. And then we also built bombers, strategic bombers, and we built fighters, and we built everything else, and we supplied food. So if you think about that, America's decision was industrial policy of mass production. So what does mass production mean? Standardization and streamline. So a part that's built in Detroit works with a part that's built in Los Angeles, works with a part that's built in Chicago. Uh, they have to work everywhere. Standardization, don't change it. Even if there's a technological update, don't change it. We'll make a kit. We'll patch it on later. That's how the Shermans work. That's why we have thousands of Sherman variants. And you know, basically everything was kind of fit, uh, was basically changed after the fact, after it was already assembled. And why, at some point, the Canadians are like, well, we don't need to build Shermans anymore because the Americans are producing so many. And that was efficiency, right? So when the you know, the, and, and we'll talk more about that. Sorry. <laughs> Get too excited, sorry. <laughs> this kind of stuff's my favorite stuff. And again, I think France, United Kingdom, Italy, and Japan were basically reactive. They, they did not have the ability. Their, their industrial policy was build what we can with what we have. And, and, and sort of reflect the you know, armor. So, how does this affect armor, right? So, Germany, again, we have advanced tanks like the Panther, the Tiger, and the Tiger P. And so, basically, the idea here is that they wanted to build tanks where one tank could defeat 10. That's a great idea in concept. The biggest problem that they had in implementing that was because these technologies were so cutting edge and so advanced, and because these tanks were basically hand built, the reliability was terrible. So uh, a lot of pan a lot of Panzer commanders would complain that even their best tanks, only 40% could be fielded at one time. And a lot of them were sitting in the back, just unable to be used or waiting for spare parts. My classic example, of course, is that I love talking about the Tiger P, because the Tiger P is such a cool thing. That thing was a hybrid gas, you know, uh, basically a hybrid gas electric, right? So it had an internal combustion engine that was powering a generator, that was powering electric. I own a Prius. I bought that thing in 2000 something, right? They were, put, they were trying to build this with, with technology of World War II back in the 40s. That's a pretty difficult thing to do. If it worked, it would have been great. But as you know, most of those kind of evaluation things, the reason why the, the, the Henschel Tiger got built instead of the Porsche Tiger was that, that that transmission system and that propulsion system just proved a little too much. Okay, Soviet Union. Um, you know, and here I show the chief to trying to get out of a, 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 a 34 because he, he loves bitching about that. But the thing that I would argue is that these tanks were not built to be you know, like he goes, well, it's really hard to change the air filter on here. Well, you just got a new one, right? These were built to last until the, the expected lifetime of a T-34 in battle, and that's it. Don't worry about fixing it. We'll give you a new one, right? We're just going to keep producing these tanks. Because honestly, we need a lot of tanks, and we need them now. We'll worry about maintenance later. 
Um, you know, uh, post-war tanks, uh, Soviet tanks change. But during the war, clearly, this is their primary motivation. And, and you'll see some of this thinking, thinking linger on in the fact that a lot of Soviets did not want to take their tanks out. Um, a lot of them did not want to take, take their tanks out a lot because this idea that they're only built for a certain lifetime, we better not use them, right? That's, 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 that's crazy. United States, on the other hand, we wanted to build our, basically, you know, we, we like our cars and everything else to be super reliable, so we build our things reliable. Anybody could service the engine. If you understood how to service a tractor, you understood how to service a Sherman. And, um, but because of that, very little changes. So at the very time when you saw an explosion of tank technology, because you can think about it, tiers six, seven, eight, that's like two years. I mean, it's like mind boggling that, you know, like it's, it's a short period of time, right, for some of the line, that so many tanks came out in such a short period of time where before that development was very slow and after that development was very slow. But during that time period, there was a lot of development. The United States, no, don't do that. Just keep turning out servants. We'll modify them later. We'll modify them after the fact. And that's basically the sort of how uh, uh, Shermans are made. And that has a definite you know, implication in terms of how the tanks you're fighting. Basically, all the Sherman hulls look alike. The suspension may work very differently. The engine may work very differently. The difference between the 75 and the 76, it's still sometimes I hit just the difference between those two guns. It's so hard to wrap around your head because it seems like they're so close in caliber, but the, their actual military performance is quite different. And again, uh, the other products kind of were reactive, and you see that in their tanks too. There's no focus, there's no, you don't see the same kind of focus. It's kind of like what we could build and where we could build. There's a next thing I'm going to do, and this is, I'm going to ask my first question. Who here has heard the Treaty of Rapallo? <laughs> the, the Treaty of Rapallo. So there's a lot of history and there's a lot of legacy in terms of how things work. One of the most interesting things that it's, it blew my mind when I learned about this was that the Soviet Union and Germany signed the Treaty of Rapallo in 22. Okay? Because both of them were pariah states at the time. Okay, this is why you got to be careful about who you make your pariah states in the international system. Germany was the loser of World War I, so obviously they were in a situation where they had very little political power. They were still suffering under the Versailles Treaty. And although Britain wanted to relax it, certainly France and other countries didn't want to relax the, the, the Versailles Treaty. So they were a pariah state. The Soviet Union was Russia and was, you know, was just wrapping up its civil war with what, 20 countries were involved in that civil war. So obviously they were not well liked in the international community. So both of them met in Rapallo and signed a secondary treaty called the Rapallo Treaty in 1922. Very few people know this, but this actually fundamentally affected armored warfare as we know it. Because because of that, Germany was prevented from basically developing Panzer technology. And because of they couldn't develop her Panzers, they couldn't train Panzer commanders, nor could they figure out doctrine. But the Soviet Union was not part of any international treaty. So the two of them negotiated where they opened the Kama Tank School. And there, Germany built tanks outside the scrutiny of the Versailles Treaty, and the Soviets learned and watched as hosts. So if you wonder why German and Russian tanks seem so more advanced than anybody else's at the start of the war, they, and why they seem to actually be the two well-balanced mortal enemies, part of it, you could argue, was because of the Rapallo Treaty and the fact that they developed their doctrines, they developed their technology, they were playing around with all the suspensions, they were building these things jointly at this location. It's a very interesting story in history, and one that I think is often kind of overlooked. And when I learned about it, it blew my mind. Um, the United Kingdom, oh, oh, yes, this is another one of my favorite ones. The United Kingdom Naval Intelligence and the Carrier Arms Race. Ah, oh, yes, British Intelligence, which is very, very good, right? Except for the fact when they report something that the Naval High Command doesn't like to hear. So my favorite one is that I was doing research for something completely unrelated, and I stumbled upon a document warning uh, British Naval High Command that both the Japanese and the Americans were fielding aircraft carriers with 50, 60, 70 aircraft, or developing them, to which the British High Command, uh, Naval Command responded, that's impossible. 
you can't fit more than 24 aircraft on an aircraft carrier, as is true of British carrier aircraft. And this is the BC why the carrier race was largely between the IJN and the USN, and not really anyone else, because they were even they even had intelligence warning them about this, and they didn't act upon it. And in case that sounds really weird, keep in mind that in the interwar period, everyone was drafting plans of who they might go to war with. The United States had plans on how we might go to war with England. Ironically, we didn't have any plans on how we, if we had to go to war with Germany and Japan. We only thought about Japan as a potential enemy. So everyone was drafting war plans against each other. The, the alliance system that came out of World War II was not, was not predetermined. We actually had war plans to fight the United Kingdom. You could tell I was doing research for alternative history. Right? <laughs> okay. So anyway, uh, anyway. So um, anyway. Uh, so um, the other thing that we talk about too, in terms of doctrine, and this had a pronounced effect on armor warfare, was blitzkrieg, right? And uh, there's a lot of debate about this because uh, everyone always says, well, you know, Guderian, who is sort of the father of German, the German concept of blitzkrieg, um, in his post-war memoirs said, well, I was really heavily influenced by B. H. Little Park. And B.H. Little Hart was a British uh, uh, military theorist. However, since then, there's also been some revisionist uh, history that points out that uh, Little Hart was actually the Guderian sponsor after the war. So there's some, maybe that wasn't a, an objective reporting. But essentially, the idea is that this idea of lightning warfare was around. And it was around before you know uh, Poland happened. And if you think about it, uh, honestly, World War II and Blitzkrieg, there were only a handful of actual battles that actually fell into the Blitzkrieg model, which was basically Poland, and even Poland less so, but primarily Battle of France. By the time you get to um, Barbarossa and the war and the Eastern Front, maybe only the early phases could really be called Blitzkrieg. Um, although we associate that word very strongly with it. And the interesting thing is that a lot of um, armor, uh, a lot of armored warfare has been based on the concepts of Blitzkrieg, but Blitzkrieg was not actually done very much. Uh, because, as we know, because we play the game World of Tanks, there's a lot of tank on tank combat, and that's the, that was a counter to the idea of Blitzkrieg. Right? Uh, Spanish Civil War was also interesting, and a lot of people fail, uh, don't always appreciate how much of an impact that had on weapons development, because uh, that was where a lot of weapon systems were tested. That's where the Stuka was tested. That's where a lot of Ger uh, German weapon systems were tested, and that's also probably why we didn't see a lot of use of chemical weapons in, um, in World War II, thankfully. Uh, uh, Japan and China. So this is an interesting thing, too, because I actually did a study uh, of what I was doing on one of these papers that's studying all this stuff. One of the amazing facts that comes out of that is that Japanese tanks were actually pretty darn good in the beginning of World War II proper in Europe because they had been fighting basically in China for about five years at that, uh, four years at that point. Um, they had large, their experience was largely against the uh, warlords of China who did not always have uh, an, uh, basically a tank-based army, so they were used to fighting against infantry, which reinforced the idea of uh, tanks as infantry support weapons. That being said, they did have a lot of tanks and, and there was a lot of development there, which is why, uh, yes, they are an armored power, not a not a very strong one relative to, let's say, European or um, American tank, as they learned against fighting against, you know, uh, Re uh, Soviet Union in Cold and Gold, that they were really not up to the Soviets, but uh, they definitely weren't armed power. Um, oh shoot, I did it again. <laughs> um, all right, submarine so targeting. Oh well, the IJN stupidly would always target prestige targets, and some argued that was because of. The or something like that, but they basically did not go after merchant shipping, which you had no problems doing, and of course, you go to their economy because of it. Damage control. All right, sorry. Now, let's go on to doctrine, because this is the next important thing. Is that, um, so doctrine also had a really, and I think this is one of the ones that affects low tier tanks enormously, right? So the idea, of, the reason why a lot of tanks that we play are, that, that we, we complain about, especially in the low to mid tiers, is the fact that they were designed as infantry support weapons. Again, except for like the Kama School where you had the Soviets and you had the Germans thinking about tank on tank warfare, largely the role of tanks was as infantry support. And because of that, they carried 
large lobby AT type guns. They didn't necessarily have high velocity cannons. And their idea was how do we take out emplacement, bunkers, and kill infantry. So that's why a lot of the tanks that we think of and we go, gosh, I don't like the way this tank performs. It's because it's not meant to be a tank to tank kill, right? But they definitely had to adapt, right? So a lot of them had an AP round. And they knew that it might happen, right? Because even in World War I, there were occasional tank tanks. Um, aircraft and manpower, counterforce or counter value. We talked about this, about this earlier too, and this is a major strategic thing, and this, this would dominate the nuclear discussion as well, so this is why I'm very familiar with this subject. Do you attack the enemy's forces, or do you attack the enemy's uh, value, or you know, basically their things that they value, which for World War II is largely population centers, right? Do you bomb cities indiscriminately, or do you destroy their factories, do you destroy their military on the field? Germany chose counterforce, so they built a lot of very good tactical aircraft. They were not thinking about counter-value warfare. They did not have bombers long enough to hit past the Urals, therefore Soviet factories were left untouched. So these things do have, a, you know, that made them super effective, that made the Luftwaffe super effective in a tactical support role, made them terrible in a strategic support role. So these decisions do have consequences in terms of how a country conducts their war. And then aircraft and sea power, obviously the, the battleship mafia versus the carrier mafia, I think this happened in almost every country. And uh, for the United States and, the, and, uh, and Japan, uh, definitely the carrier faction was strong enough and they were able to prove how effective those weapons were, that, that, was, that was justified. So again, what we see is that UK, France, uh, Japan, US, and Italy largely had infantry support tanks. In, in 1939 or 1940, I want to say the US had 50 tanks, and I believe the heaviest gun they carried was a 50 cal. We had no real concept of tank on tank warfare. Okay. Um, so our, what, what tanks that we were thinking of developing, the primary idea was infantry support. So of course my much maligned M3 it was a stopgap measure, obviously, to try to build a tank that could, uh, that could serve in the anti-infantry and in the anti-tank roles, hence it did neither very well. Oh, and I'm running out of time. Okay, um, let me see, what else can we cover? Okay, uh, tanks as anti-armor, so Germany and the Soviet Union, so the Soviet Union definitely focused on that. Um, oh, shit, I have a lot of this stuff. <laughs> uh, anyway, we'll just join. <laughs> So because we have a volunteer military, we're always faced with um, sort of the, the, the people problem, right? And um, I actually, for a short stint while I was doing some of these other games, my game company was somehow hired to help with the future combat systems. But future combat systems are a perfect example because they talked about a network warrior. Every vehicle was part of a network. What we would use is network uh, drones and all supported with all this other stuff. The idea was remotely fighting weapon systems. And uh, Pentagon says, well, you know, we really need guys who can kick down doors. So I think that that's ultimately the tension. I think that during, uh, not to be political, but this is just a reality, is that during the Bush administration, the idea was that let's move towards, initially, the idea that we're going to move to a post, a post ground force, a military force structure, where everything would be special forces and air power. But then uh, Iraq and Afghanistan proved that that was not going to work and that we still needed a strong ground contingent. And that's when you have the uh, US armor kind of move more towards the striker, kind of, you know, like uh, lightly armored vehicles and everything else. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, because the defense problems haven't gone away, we may see a return to specialization again. So uh, these Omni weapons were really a good idea when you saw a very small military structure, which the, the F-35 conceptually is supposed to be, right? It's supposed to be a fighter that, oh, all forces can use it and everything. Else. Oh, but the Navy needs something that can do this. Oh, but you know, the Air Force needs to build do this. So I think, although that has been sort of the current trend, 
That's because our weapon systems take three, four years, uh, three, four decades to develop now, that they get mired in all of this. I think that we'll probably see uh, emergence of more dedicated military stuff. But, uh, you know, this is my speculation. Anyway. <laughs> <Yay>! <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, yes. Two, two books for your book list. Uh, one would be um, Defense of Delbert Cliff. Okay. Which is, a, uh, it's a, written by a British general about the Boer War. It's sort of the empiric um, guy wakes up through a series of battles and he learns something new each battle. And the other would be James McDonough of Defense of Hill 781, which is actually about a specific combined arm engagement at the National Grid. Oh, interesting. Okay, that, that's actually very cool. Thank you for that information. And uh, yeah, I have to say that uh, the, the idea, you know, the military does take these uh, learning things very seriously. I will say that, you know, in Florida, there's a school of excellence. And this is a, this is the thing that totally blew me away because as a game developer, I never thought of the army as basically a schoolhouse, especially as an educator. But basically what they did is that they were collecting all the lessons from learned in Iraq and digesting them and turning them out and making sure that anyone who needed to find out about these things could actually learn about it. So it's a lot about education, right? Because yes, in Hollywood, it's the same guy that happens to be at all of these important decisive battlefields at this, you know, somehow, mysteriously, but militaries are large organizations, right? And any one person only sees their one slice of it, but the more that your soldiers would see of the bigger picture, the better they, they, you know, it, it's in a weird sort of way, and I, 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 I'm not trying to trivialize this in any way, but in a weird sort of way, when you play a thousand battles in World of Tanks, you've experienced a lot of tank combat that honestly, you know, if you were a ground soldier, you one or two engagements. Of course, the consequences are very different, but I mean, I'm just saying that, that this is the reason why a lot of this is about education. Okay. Uh, and, oh, cool. Yes. Have you guys looked into trying to implement some way of reliability in the game? I realize it wouldn't be easy, but I'm sure you guys want to do it. I think the biggest problem with reliability, and uh, thank you very much for the question, uh, I think uh, the biggest problem with the reliability is a question of do you ever want to jump into a game and your tank doesn't work? Right, so I mean, it's, it's, it's easier to give you things than to take them away. Because if, if you, I own this tank, and then I say you can't use it, that's a very negative feeling, and we are playing a game. So that's the kind of the, the thing that you have to take into account. And I think, you know, it's really funny because everyone always talks about Russian bias, but I always say one thing, right? So the thing about it is that the tank, even in World of Tanks, although World of Tanks probably has one of the best engagement. I Honestly, I, just, I play a lot of other tank games, right? So in terms of like the World of Tanks series of games has this pretty good engagement range, okay? And you're dealing with everything else. Beyond that, might be a little bit more realistic, but it's about right. The reason why everyone says, oh God, this is such a, a Soviet bias, is that the, a lot of these guns, we're using real world specs, and we are now engaging at the sort of the range minimums in the game, just because engaging a spec like this is actually not very interesting. So um, that is why, you know, like these, these weapons that have a high dispersion are still effective at the range. So by that token, I think trying to introduce these other factors will only confound the game, and you'll find that you're alone in the battlefield, that won't be very fun. Like, you know, like, so, or if there's a reliability factor, or we somehow make it so that we abstract that reliability factor, um, then you change the game balance considerably. And I think game balance is gonna be probably the hot topic in the next session, so I think that that's a question that can come up there. <coughs> anyway, oh, yes. A hey, question, is there a way designers could uh, segregate out World War II tanks in one, in one group and not uh, be involved in 1960s tanks on the battlefield? Yeah. That paper's already shown. Can't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, that's uh, that's something that's always being considered. That's something that's always being considered. Yes. Uh, do you see the future of the game moving more towards uh, the historical side or more towards the kind of game and action? So I will say this because I've actually been doing a lot, uh, dealing a lot with the press. Oh, by the way, it's not the same. But yes. Thank you for your question. Um, uh, we've been dealing with that question. A, a lot of it is to do. You have to understand that to make this game work and to make the economy work, 
We have to bring in new players. And uh, people who know history largely know of our game. Now, there are still people out there who haven't, but to a large part, to that market we communicated to, right? So we're always looking to add new players to the game and to the economy to keep the service full, you know, to keep the economy running and everything else. So we still will retain that historical core. That's still a part of the game. So, and, and, and I think we talked, we touched on this earlier, this whole idea that, you know, we have a lot of different people and a lot of people have different specialties. So it's not like all of a sudden we can repurpose, like I can't all of a sudden start writing code that does graphic engines, right? So. Um, there are people who are dedicated to maintaining sort of the, the, the core part of our historical gameplay. Those people aren't going away. But what we do is with these other ventures, when we're exploring with alternative history and all this other stuff, that is primarily to, you know, basically for people who have played, it gives them an exciting reason to come back. And for people who have not yet discovered our game because it was so historical, it gives them some incentive to like, hey, I'm gonna try this game out. And then they're gonna say, oh, these historical things are actually really cool. Trust me, that does happen. And so that then they'll become part of the general ecosystem as well. So that's why you see this two-tier strategy, and it's not giving one up to do the other, it's doing that to support the main one. So oh, yes. Oh, and I let me remind me, I, I'll give you one of these cards afterwards. Oh, uh, I think I'm out of time though. I think we have the next sorry about that, I should have given more warning on that. Uh, but we do have the next panel, so um, is Jared here? Oh yeah, Jared, do you want to go ahead and introduce your panel?